know, you know what's really bizarre, Jack, is that we have these private prisons that have now hired lobbyists to go get minimum mandatories and you In the spring of 2002, five current and former ranking police officers got together to talk about the war on drugs and its impact on their fellow officers. Over the next three years, this group of five swelled to 500 as current and former DEA agents, police chiefs, judges and prosecutors joined their ranks. Now they've gone public and what they're saying is shaking the drug war establishment to its roots. I think one of the things that I need to confront with, with respect to my own behavior is that even though for many years I have believed that this drug war is not just nonsense but harmful financially and, 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 and psychically and spiritually, it's just an immoral uh, proposition. I should have been saying much more of that much more strenuously. When I joined New Jersey State Police in 1964, we had 1,700 troopers. We had a, a seven-man narcotic unit, always seemed perfectly adequate for the job we needed to do. And then overnight, as a result of these bills from Mr. Nixon's, we went from a seven-man unit to a 76-person narcotic bureau. Well, what they decided to do was they took undercover people like myself, and they targeted us against small friendship groups, groups of young people in college like yourselves. And as soon as we got in there and became their friends, come a Friday night, somebody would say, hey, school's out, we're off work, anyone want to get high? And of course, if nobody said that, that was our job. If somebody simply passed a marijuana cigarette, to me, they became a drug dealer. That hand held marijuana cigarette would send that person to jail for seven years. Over a thousand young people went to jail as a direct result of what I did out there as one undercover agent, something that I'm certainly not proud of today. When I was a police officer in 1966, I used to enjoy kicking in doors and, and going after, uh, you know, a half a baggie of marijuana or a seed even for that matter. It was a felony. Uh, we were told in the academy that that was a big pinch. It was really important to collect those numbers, and I did it. I did it with zeal. I did it with a lot of vigor. But after about 14 months on the job, having had uh, uh, a principal prosecutor slap me upside the head and question my understanding of the Constitution, uh, I began to understand that the 17 or the 19-year-old kid I had in the backseat of my police car was not a criminal at all. I'm a retired police captain. I spent 20 years in law enforcement working for the town of Tonawanda Police Department. Now, the only way this war on drugs is going to be won is if we make drugs go away. We've got to win the war. The enemy's got to be gone. We're making a war on drugs. Drugs are the enemy. We've got to make them go away. Show of hands. How many people in this room believe we can do anything to make drugs go away? No more heroin. No more crack cocaine. No more marijuana. Drugs are gone, let's move on to the next problem. Okay, so we can't make these drugs go away, so this war on drugs really isn't a good title. It makes us feel good, we're going to win the war, but it really doesn't describe the policy. I got another word that describes the policy perfectly. Prohibition. How many people got a picture of a big black car, Chicago, Al Capone, and the Thompson submachine gun in it? Anybody? How many other thought when you hear that word, that doesn't work? Isn't that what we learned in this country between 1920 and 1933? Prohibition doesn't work. That's why we ended it. Well, that is a description of the policy that we live under today in America when it comes to drugs. Under prohibition, we have given the right uh, uh, to the criminal of who's going to supply the drugs to the United States, what kind of drugs are going to be supplied, how much those drugs are going to cost, how they're going to be produced, how potent they're going to be, what age levels they're going to sell to, and where they're going to sell. And if they decide they're going to sell to 10-year-old kids on our playgrounds, by God, that's where they'll be sold. The thing that gets me is we don't learn a thing from history. We, we want our institutions to be pure and not corrupt, but yet we do the things that we know it's going to corrupt them. And the way I like to tell the story is now you came into this thing a bright-eyed, 
shiny young recruit, you're a police officer four or five years, you've seen the, 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 the wasted energy that you spent on this drug war, and now you're standing in a motel room where the drug arrest had just been made, laying on the bed is a hundred and some thousand dollars, hasn't been counted yet in cash, in your back pocket is a $3,800 bill from the plumber that you didn't know how you were going to pay, and it doesn't make any difference anyways. And you take your first taste, and then you're gone. After I retired from New Jersey State Police, I co helped co-found this group called LEAP, or Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. It's a group that was created to give voice to all the current and former members of law enforcement who feel the war on drugs is not only a dismal failure, but it's a terribly destructive policy. Uh, I remember just going in, taking a small area of my community, and for all practical purposes, cordoning it off, uh, completely cleaning it up, using some pretty sophisticated techniques, uh, trampling all over the edges of the Constitution to do so. But I mean, really cleaning it up and getting all of the dope that was out of there. And to my dismay, 90 days later, uh, I had had a Haitian group to move in from downstate. Uh, I had the Miami boys to move in from Jacksonville. And they were shooting machine guns and beating people mercilessly, and, and I wanted my old dope to be was back. <laughs> we didn't have an illegal drug in this country until 1914, when we passed the Harrison Anti-Drug Act. Just before 1914, the government said, we have 1.3% of the people in this country addicted to drugs. God, we can't, we can't have that, right? So they pass this law. Now you fast forward 56 years to 1970, the beginning of the war on drugs. In 1970, the government said 1.3% of the population is addicted to drugs. Can't have it, gotta start a war on drugs. 36 years later and a trillion dollars and all these lives lost, 1.3% of the population is addicted to drugs. Have you ever woke up in the morning, turn on your TV set, and you see this wonderful picture on your TV. There'll be a big, long table. On one end of the table, there'll be a big pile of money. On the other end of the table, a big pile of guns and drugs. And out in front of the table, there'll be a district attorney. And he'll relate to you about the two-year investigation that culminated last night when we went out with 68 warrants. Have you seen that story? More than once. Yeah, a whole bunch of times, huh? And you're going to keep seeing it, too, over and over again. Let me give you an example. These three people here are my gang. I'm the drug kingpin. Okay? They're running my, these three are running my street crew for me. They're taking care of business out there. I'm collecting the bucks. Things are fine. I'm the one with all the bling bling. They're basically paying rent with the money they make. But, hey, life's like that. All of a sudden, I get slammed with that 25-year-to-life. I'm out of the picture. Now, how do these three wonderful people figure out who takes it over? Well, you get your attorneys, you get your attorneys, you get your attorneys, you get the contracts together, right? You look them over, and you see, right? Isn't that how it works? No. You get your people, you get your people, you get your people, and you fight it out on the streets. And here's the kicker. When the violence stops, when the shootings stop, you know what we know then? One of these people is the charge now. And you know what we start doing? The two-year investigation. So in two years, we can have that wonderful television program with the big pile of guns, the big pile of drugs, the big pile of money. We can do it all over again. But you know what never changes? The availability of the drugs on the street. My name is Minch Lewis. I was city auditor in the city of Syracuse, New York. And at the end of my uh, term, one of the last things that we, we did was a review of the cost of police services in the city. And that led us to discover that most of the money that the city spent for police services was related to uh, drug-related arrests. You arrest a rapist, the rape stop. You arrest a bank robber, the bank robbery stop. What have you ever seen stop when you arrest a drug dealer or a drug user? Nothing. Nothing changes. Nothing changes. And the question really was, is that effective? Is that, is that doing anything? Is that, is that giving people any greater feeling of security uh, when we're spending approximately, uh, you know, $10 million a year to, to make these arrests. 
And the answer that we found after talking to people was no. This is not providing additional security. This is not giving them any greater feeling of belonging or, or security in their neighborhood. And if it isn't, then there must be a better alternative. Remove the profit motive. If you remove the profit motive, you can do away with almost all these problems. And how do you do that? Simple. You end prohibition, which can only mean one thing. Legalize drugs. Legalize all drugs. Legalize them so that we can control them and regulate them and keep them out of the hands of our children. Drug legalization is not to be construed as an approach to our drug problem. Drug legalization is about our crime and violence problem. Once we legalize drugs, we got to then buckle down and start dealing with our drug problem. And that's not going to be easy, but it's something we can do. 50% of the adult cigarette smokers in this society have quit in the last 10 years. That's an amazing success story when you're talking about the most addictive drug we know of, nicotine. It's an amazing success story. How did we accomplish this wonderful success story? We educated. Really got the word out there to people about how dangerous this substance was. Let me tell you about the outcomes of uh, legalization. First outcome is that 1.6 million less people would have to be arrested here every year, right? Which means something very important monetarily to everyone in this room, everyone in this state, which is in deficit spending like all the other states, everyone in this country, because this is what we spend every year to fight this war. $69 billion down the rat hole. Useless. If we really want to improve our urban neighborhoods, the most important thing that we could do, the single most important thing that we could do, is end the war on drugs. South Africa in 1993, under apartheid, they incarcerated 851 black males per 100,000. In the United States in 2004, under prohibition, we incarcerate at the rate of 4,919 black males per 100,000. Now, how anybody could look at this and not see institutionalized racism, I don't know. I think the drug war has been, arguably, the uh, single most devastating, dysfunctional, harmful social policy since slavery. I think it has devastated our communities. I think it has ruined the lives of so many of our fellow citizens. I believe that it has cost the national, the state, and the local treasury uh, obscene amounts of money, and for what?